Yeah, so the, I will like, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Jeremy Fries. <laughs> so um, so uh, probably many of you are familiar with his work, although not necessarily because we're such an interdisciplinary conference. Um, but so I won't say a lot about his work, but he's been known to write some stata adus in you know, a day or a day and a <laughs> half or so that become quite famous. And if you really pay close attention, he has been the owner of some famous pets as well. A little secret trivia there. So let me hand this over. Uh, okay, are we ready? Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the generous uh, introduction. Uh, you can see our pets at Tizzy and Friends on Instagram. Um, not just Tizzy the dog, but also our bunnies. Uh, and uh, I do also want to thank uh, Katrine and others in the back uh, who helped me out in my time of need. I forgot how European water bottles are often carbonated water and will explode if you shake them up and back. So you missed earlier, I was doused in water and they came to my aid. So I am well internally hydrated, but not so obviously externally so. Um, so uh, for a talk at a open science conference, it is probably bad that I start out with a lie. Now, not about the dog and the bunnies, they are real, but the title of the talk um, is uh, not so much about the social science of social science, although I couldn't quite resist that, but uh, instead, um, uh, sociology is a field that uh, brings together uh, humanities and more sort of scientific minded, the two cultures uh, in, in uh, classical ways uh, speaking. And, uh, and, and really what uh, I'm doing here is, is in uh, in that world, there has been uh, a very long sort of, of line of work uh, in uh, humanistic sociology on science uh, studies. Uh, and that field has had things to say about replication for quite some time. Um, and as I talk about it, I'm, I'm going to use ideas from there to talk about developments in uh, open social science and to think about some of the issues that we've talked about uh, today. Now, I come to this myself. We are uh, a room, I think it is fair to say, a room full, uh, essentially, of activists, right? And uh, uh, activists, open source act or open science activists, uh, and and really, in, in a lot of ways, uh, part of a fledgling uh, social movement. And like a lot of social movements, uh, we will see how successful uh, it is uh, in achieving our aims. Um, but in that respect, one can see um, a, a lot of the dynamics that one might associate with social movements. Um, and other things uh, present in uh, open science. Um, I do want to, to uh, give uh, some of my uh, activist um, cred before we start, just as some, uh, some uh, plugs here. Uh, Skip gave our, uh, our morning uh, keynote. Uh, Skip was the founder of the TESS uh, project, Time Sharing Experiments uh, in Social Science. Um, this has been, so uh, we provide survey uh, funding for survey experiments. Um, it is, as a result of that, the largest body of behavioral or social science uh, experiments that's publicly available that are not in any sense uh, selected. That is to say, every experiment we've done over the history of tests that is available. And so as a result of that, some people were able a few years ago to do a study of publication bias uh, using our, our data. Um, I'm also uh, currently co-PI of the general social uh, survey in the United States, and while I can take uh, no credit for this, I do think that the General Social Survey does not uh, get enough credit as sort of the OG of uh, open uh, social science uh, insofar as from its uh, outset in the early uh, 
uh, 1970s. It's always had a commitment to the data being available immediately uh, to everyone. That is to say that the day there's no, no investigators or anything, I as a co-PI do not get to analyze any GSS data before uh, it is available to everyone. And uh, especially rare nowadays, and rare for, for uh, knowable reasons perhaps, um, the GSS does not have uh, rules about redistribution. You don't even have to give an uh, email address and stuff in order to download the GSS data. Um, uh, and various people redistribute it, and we're fine with that, and I think that it's great um, uh, currently. Uh, also, um, I do have a book coming out, and I would be risk remiss not to mention that, but um, with uh, Garrett uh, Christensen and uh, Ted McGill, the people from the BITS um, Center in Berkeley, uh, and I have done a book on how to do uh, open science. That's coming out from the University of California Press uh, in the summer. Um, but this talk is going to be based more on, um, or on work that I have done with uh, a then graduate student, now a postdoc at UCLA, um, that I've worked with David Peterson where we have written some papers on uh, objectivity. And David and my collaboration is, is interesting. I've just identified myself as uh, an open science uh, activist. Uh, David is someone, David is an ethnographer who does science studies. His dissertation research involves looking at different uh, psychology labs and visiting those labs and doing other things uh, with that. Uh, traditional sort of science studies uh, thing. And we got together and as uh, some of these, uh, as. Uh, social psychology was, was uh, experiencing the early throes of uh, what came to then be called a crisis in social psychology. And I, I followed this very closely. I've been long very interested in social psychology. I'm also somebody who admittedly is very interested in drama and train wrecks and things, and so following it uh, for those sorts of reasons as well. Um, but then we started to talk about the possibility of doing a paper and the possibility of what sorts of things one could talk about from a science studies perspective, because really, in a lot of ways, um, it's, it, 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 what is happening now is an amazing episode, I think, that will, that will be remembered for, for, for years hence in the history of science, the history of social science, uh, uh, certainly, and something that reflects a lot of things that are really actually quite new in, uh, in how we understand science. And one of the things that's interesting, if you look at some of the, the things in, in psychology, is you'll see uh, some writings in psychology, I won't, I won't trot out any names, but people talking about, well, you know, psychologists don't do this, and this is weird because it's standard in real sciences like physics or biology to have these sorts of things, and it doesn't happen in psychology. And often that is in fact based on some, some, some really quite erroneous ideas about what people do in, in physics or biology um, and things like that. Um, those, those fields, every field, there's a phrase in science studies that, that distance leads to enchantment. Everybody thinks that this other discipline they're looking at, especially if it's got a lot of, of, of prestige or whatever, that they really have their stuff together. And it's our field where we can see that's got all of the mess uh, and weirdness and stuff. And that's really not, not, not so. Now, the particular jumping off point that we had for talking about this, so what you'll see today, just so that we're not a little confused, is is we're going to be talking about a lot of the same things that have come out in other talks, and we're going to be presenting them in kind of a more kind of like, let's think about the big picture of this kind of way, right? Um, uh, and, and what this might mean, and especially for the, our orienting thing is some early work on, or, or some classic sort of work that's existed in science studies talking about uh, objectivity. Now, there's this idea that, that do people in science studies, do they believe in objective reality? This isn't anything like that, right? But you would recognize, right, that, that, that even if objective reality is eternal, right, that objectivity itself is a concept that has history. That is to say that people did not always have, by any means, a concept of objectivity, as objectivity is something that was uh, a, an important matter in constructing inquiry. And objectivity, of course, really only exists as a concept in that regard once you get the idea that there is this thing that is subjectivity, and subjectivity, if you don't take it into account, can mess you up. You have to have that, right? And in particular, this quote, this classic book, uh, Daston and Gallup's, is a longer work, but the 2007 book uh, really brought it together. They have this great quote about the foundations of epistemology, and it's that all epistemology begins in fear. Right? That is to say that, that when there is right, this fear that we thought we knew how to do something, but now we have a sense that there's a problem, 
This is when people take a step back and start to wonder about a larger sort of framework and start to have some of these discussions about how it is we think that we know when it, what it is that we know. And the, the, the Dastin and Gallison work really in that respect has this idea of, of seeing objectivity as existing um, and, and it, it changing over time as a result of this, this struggle that, or this, this unfolding process that, that happens where what will happen is that there will be a concern about that there is this particular type of, they call it epistemic vice, but this, this sort of intellectual sin, uh, if you will, that comes forward and threatens knowledge. There's a problem with the knowledge for producing, and it's because of this epistemic vice. And then that leads, in turn, to the rise of some new idea of what is an epistemic virtue that would counter the threat. Right? And exactly what is the vice and what it is what unfolds over time. And the great seesaw that exists at the heart of objectivity is the question of, wouldn't it be better if we got human judgment out of this and had a process where just the machine or just the algorithm would figure out the answer for us, taking the human out of the loop and a recognition of the importance of expertise and judgment, right? So in other words, the human mind, right, we think of as both the, the, the place where a lot of bias comes from, and yet it's also the place where judgment and expertise come from. And so how to maximize one and maximize the other. And so in science studies, we people have talked about uh, different parts of these. And the big idea in our paper that I'll mention here is that even though we didn't know it while we're sitting here doing this uh, room and talking about open social science, is that we're actually all also part in reflecting this change that is happening on what, uh, where, what objectivity is, right? That there's a new movement uh, on what objectivity is. Uh, we wanted to call it something else, and reviewers beat us down uh, until we now are calling it statistical objectivity. I'll mention maybe later what it was we wanted to call it, right? Now, to give a roadmap of where this is going to go, right, I want to first get to talk about how the problem right, is made visible. Right? What's the thing that causes this, this, uh, this sense of there being a problem, and how might this be different from other ways in the past? One might have seen there being a problem in a literature. And then what, how is it that people understand the epistemic vice uh, solving the problem. Skip, today you set this up wonderfully, uh, as we will see. Um, and then, what are the virtues that uh, then are seen as countering the problem? It's not going to surprise what I'm going to say, but maybe uh, the context of it. And then I will have this, this coda for how we actually see a lot of these tensions reproducing themselves, but in a different guise from uh, before. The parts are not necessarily equal in size, so don't something, if I'm only like through here, don't think like I'm necessarily only halfway, um, if I uh, have the sense of this uh, worked out. But let's think about this thing. How's the, how's the problem with prevailing practice made visible? And I should say from this, so our study, because David studied psychology and I was obsessively following social psychology, in our paper and in this talk, we're using social psychology as a case study. So that's going to inform the examples um, from what we talk about, although uh, we also draw that a lot of these same things we're talking about, you can point. We could have done the paper, I think, equivalently using examples of crisis in some fields of medicine. And I'm very familiar with social and genomics, and certainly with the candidate gene failures in, in uh, genomics as well. But social psychology is the source of our examples. Um, but how is this problem made visible? Now, if you're familiar with the recent uh, history of psychology, you're almost certainly familiar with with uh, issues of, of fraud from um, uh, Diedrich Stoppel. Um, and then if you're, especially if you're American, maybe otherwise um, familiar with the academic misconduct for, uh, issues uh, surrounding uh, Mark Hauser at uh, Harvard. Um, and both of those, from the, from the standpoint of scientific scandals, especially scandals involving misconduct or fraud, those were both very normal in terms of how it was they came to light. That is to say, they both came to light as a result of, uh, if you will, a whistleblower who was relatively, who were relatively close to the scene, right? They were, I think, and actually in both cases, uh, uh, graduate students or young professors. It's always kind of presented 
in, in science, like it's like, isn't it amazing that these young people were the ones to come to the force and blow the whistle? But that's actually the usual pattern of the young idealistic uh, people being the people to, to call attention uh, to scientific uh, scandals. But it's an internal, right? It's something where somebody close to it is calling attention to the problem. But at shortly after uh, the Stoppel thing broke, there were other instances that you may be familiar with with psychology where a very different there were people who resigned jobs as a result of accusations of fraud, but the way that those came to light is very different from this whistleblower story because what you have were examples of people without access to the original data collection, right, um, advancing allegations, uh, uh, starting investigations on the basis of data that information that you could see in the paper itself, right? So something from Assignments of paper, the idea of, well, if you look at the similarity in means across different uh, conditions in, in uh, uh, the experiment, uh, look, this person's paper is way, way outside the norm for our simulations. This is, in other words, really unlikely uh, to be uh, this level of consistency to be something that you would observe, right? Or um, with a different author, the idea of, well, if you look at the standard deviations across conditions, look, in these other studies we're taking as controls, they vary quite a bit. The vertical distance of the bar is variation among standard deviations. But here, in this person's studies, look at how they don't vary at all. And it really takes advantage in this way. Or another example, right, would be on the left, right, here are control examples of the way in which a mean would differ from a low to a medium to a high condition of an experiment. They're all still examples where you have an upward trend, but you notice it's not a perfectly linear trend, whereas here on the right, we have a bunch of studies reported from the same author. Look how linear these are compared to these. And exactly right, right? It creates this possibility of an ocular sort of trauma, right? In other words, the idea that whether or not it ends up being fraud or something different, right? The idea that there is something fishy going on is something that leaps out at you from the page, from uh, this ability to do this visualization, right? If we take the example from, from uh, poli sci, uh, the liqueur incident in poli sci, here are examples of what feeling thermometer data from general populations might look like if it was cross-tabbed. There's a general correlation, but hardly the same, except when you get over here, and here is liqueur and a data set that he's believed to simply have lifted the distribution from in fabricating the data from his study, right? So it's a way of making the evidence uh, extremely compelling. But notable again here, right, is this idea that, that instead of the, the exposure coming from inside, this is the uh, ability to look at information in the paper, and especially then, right, to, to extract statistical information to compare to what would we expect? What is the normal warp and weft of variation in studies, and does it look like that? And if not, what should we conclude? Now, of course, these are examples uh, uh, contended with misconduct or fraud, but even as we've seen in earlier discussions today, we can just use it to say that this literature is not exactly what we would have thought in terms of how it was produced, right? So if we take examples of, of funnel plots, right, the idea is um, might we expect, right, might we expect that as, uh, if all studies are estimating the same parameter, that the, as sample size increases, they should get tighter together, but that shouldn't be something where they're effectively estimating a different mean, right? Um, uh, but what funnel plots like this allow us to see is this idea, well, uh, either the parameter is shifting or there's some kind of publication bias or something. There's something missing in this literature. There's something where this literature is not exactly what we might interpret it as being. Or the P-curve work in uh, social psychology, um, trading on the idea that if there is a real effect represented by the red line um, in the example here, right, if there's a real true effect, then p-values that are less than 0.01 should be, uh, should be much more common than p-values from 0.4 to 0.5. If there's no effect but no p-hacking, the, the distribution of p-values should be uniform. That's what makes them a p-value, right? 
Um, but if there's p-hacking, you'll get this weird pattern. And how else would this pattern come about is the argument where, in fact, you get these p-values that are close to 0.5 coming up more frequently than very low p-values, right? It's the same idea. And what's interesting about this, right, and it's the same thing that's interesting about putting means of someone's experiment up to some larger distribution or compared to a control distribution, right, is it, it's, it's calling into account a study based on its, its similarity with other studies, and especially the idea of excessive similarity or excessive uh, results of a search in nature than but what we would expect by chance. Right? What do I mean uh, by, in other words, uh, well, well, we'll get to this a little bit later, but, but, but in an individual study, right, in an individual study you have results that might seem very clean when you look at it and, wow, there's this robust pattern that supports the hypothesis. But then, if that same pattern starts to pull up across multiple studies, it looks a lot less convincing because it looks like there must be something that's left out of it. If we talk, a lot of times when people talk about publication, a common metaphor that you'll hear people use, right, is this idea of a gauntlet, right? And we could think of it goes something like this, right? The author, they send, they send, they, they get their paper all, they massage, they get their paper all ready to go, send their paper out into the world. They have thought that they have strengthened their paper in every way possible against the potential swords that reviewers might throw at them. I, I put on the armor of fixed effects to try to please this reviewer um, and such with the hope of getting to the other side and getting to the acceptance letter, this, this gauntlet of publication. Um, but, but, but what this, what, and, and we're usually noticing that this is why we have, have strong methods. We might spend a lot of time on framing our paper as well, right? Um, but the classic idea of, of, of what, where we look at, when we say, is this study a good study? Are these results results that we should be believed? Right? The, the, the premise of methodology, as usually conceived, is the idea that we're going to judge that based on the methods. Right? We even might think that it's, if there's a virtue in not looking to the results. We want to know, is this a well-done study? And if it's a well-done study, that means that the results are credible. We're going to judge a study by the methods. Right? But what we have here is we have this, this second possibility. It's almost like a paper, papers run that gauntlet, and then when there are enough of those papers, there's this possibility of a second gauntlet. Right? And that second gauntlet is the idea that we can assess studies by a collection of results. And does that collection of results exhibit the pattern that we would think is the pattern that we should associate with it being a coherent literature. And if not, we might start to do something like think about, well, how can we correct those findings for the studies we can't see? Is it something where we shouldn't believe these findings altogether? And, and what I think is especially interesting about this is the idea that the very things that might make an individual study, especially under past regimes, seem really compelling, like, look, these people did 11 experiments, and all of them worked out in favor of this hypothesis. Wow, they have found something really interesting here. When you read like 10 or 11 or 12 of those papers all in a row, right, and you put them together in a model, and you see like, wow, a lot of those p-values were actually pretty close to 0.05 and just over the threshold. The very things that made any one of those studies look very good become something that, in fact, makes that whole literature more vulnerable to being undermined. Suddenly it looks like, oh, yeah, this is all too good to be true. Right? And you couldn't have seen that from any one study. And even, in fact, any one of those studies, any one of those sets of 11 experiments may all have been true and correct and absolute. But the literature itself, you can say, in the same way that we were showing with all those plots earlier, there is something fishy here. This does not add up. And it's only visible from the combination of a bunch of different studies and being able to interrogate those all together. That's going to be the just of where we're going to be in terms of claiming that this is a different way of thinking about objectivity that didn't exist. Um, uh, Meta-analysis existed, but, but the way that this has become a foundation is very different um, from past ways of thinking of objectivity. Okay? Now, how is it that we should then think about what is the vice? If we think about this as a way of making that problem visible, right? In other words, being able to say, 
like, look, I, I can't tell you exactly what is wrong with this study. Maybe there are questionable research practices. Maybe there's p-hacking. I can't prove any of that. What I can say is this literature doesn't, it looks too good to be true, right? It can't all be uh, as they're saying, right? What is seen as being the vice that's causing this problem? This is where I said uh, Skip uh, uh, helped with this uh, uh, wonderfully today. Um, because what's interesting um, is, you know, I'm, I'm from uh, sociology. You might think that sociological, the sociologists, when they start studying replication, they're going to be really socio sociological about it. And psychologists, when they're talking about the replication problem and what causes it, they're going to be super psychological about it. And political scientists, they're going to be very much about the politics of it um, and such. And while, while it's certainly true that you can see moments of that, especially when people are trying to speak to the discipline as a whole, um, uh, maybe win commerce in their discipline as a whole, um, and you can see, like you might say, that there's a, a psychological dialect or a sociological dialect. Instead, what I find to be endlessly fascinating about this, right, is the extent to which different disciplines talking about the replication problem, it all sort of brings out our inner economist in talking about the roots of it, or at least a strongly economically uh, inflected version of this. Because um, it's the idea that the problem the problem is to be seen in incentives, right? And I'm not saying that this is, the thing that science studies people do is we're just explaining how the discourse sorts of things work. And this is something that I myself believe, but it's also something where it doesn't have to be that this is the way that this argument was necessarily framed just because I think that it's true. But yet, right, the, the scientist, they've seen the scientist as being trapped in a system of bad uh, incentives. And you, there's, I, I could fill many, many slides uh, with quotes from this, but you have, references to there being a dysfunctional reward structure. You have the idea of an academic advancement uh, ecosystem. You have, uh, I think, what is a, is, a, is a beautiful phrasing of it from Brian Nozick and collaborators, the idea that there is some essential conflict between getting it published, that is to say the careerist um, uh, goals of doing research, and getting it right, what we might think of as being uh, uh, what should be uh, the goal, and then the kicker which you also see, in, and uh, this I think is from Roger uh, Gunnar-Sarola, right? This idea that, that also it becomes a situation where in effect, right, uh, uh, if you don't, it's, it's almost like uh, in sports the idea of, of like bicycle racing and performance enhancing drugs or something like that. That in other words, right, once the system becomes distorted, even the person who wants to do things the right way, they're going to be penalized for it because they're not going to have the study where 11 experiments all line up perfectly, right? And so they, in other words, it becomes a game that people have to play, right, um, uh, if they want to succeed in the business, right? And, and so that, I think, is the, is the overarching thing. Now, I think in particular the way that people talk about this in psychology, it's almost like a perfect storm of three things coming together, any one of which, perhaps, if it didn't exist, wouldn't, it wouldn't lead to the same magnitude of the problem. Now, one of these is the idea of there being unlikely hypotheses. And this is part of where you can see where um, uh, literatures themselves can sort of get out of hand. And, and I have thin ice up there because I, the way I think of it is my mind is sort of progressively strolling out on thin ice, right? So say, for as, ex, as a real example in psychology, you have the idea um, that, uh, that uh, when women are ovulating, even though most women can't tell uh, when they're ovulating without using a, a calendar or whatnot, but the women are ovulating, they have higher libidos, right? Um, you can say, oh, well, that would make sense. Maybe it's even something that you can see in sexual behavior. So that becomes a study. You can see, well, maybe that is true. And then it stretches to, well, and so they're also more likely to wear red on those days when they're ovulating. And not only that, but more likely to wear red to such an extent that you have a diary study of like 100 people and you don't really measure ovulation all that well. You can still see it in that study. Right? And then, if you, if you believe that, right, so you see I'm getting farther out, because it's like, well, if you believe that, then is it the case then, well, when women are ovulating, if they're in a committed relationship, then they're actually, they're more conservative during those times and more likely, they, they are more likely to support Mitt Romney during those times than other times. There's actual work. That, but this sort of thing where there's this progressive sort of increasing, and so then what happens, right, is, is you have this thing where, 
where within the literature it seems like there are these sort of steps that lead to this finding, and then the finding surfaces, and you have someone like Andrew Gelman or someone else become aware of just this sort of later step, like ovulation and conservatism, and being able to present that immediately as, doesn't this seem insane? Uh, to people and to the larger audience, it, it, it sort, of, sort of forward, but to the people in the, in the research literature, it makes, it makes sense, right? It makes it sense that it's one step after, after another. Um, uh, and the other thing, and this, this gets to, um, I think what Skip was talking about this morning, a great point that Skip was making, I think, this morning is the idea that, like, like what this, all of our, the, our interest in open science uh, obviously becomes a lot more important if we believe that what we are doing is important, right? Um, and uh, one of the things that, that, that you can see, um, almost people maybe can't quite raise it in some of these debates, but it gets very close to the surface, especially in terms of when people start to talk about the interpersonal issues around replication. Is this, what's the, what's the harm of there being erroneous claims uh, in, in the literature? What, what's, the, what, what's the harm, for example, if there are people out there who believe that, that uh, ovulation makes people more likely to wear, uh, makes women more likely to wear red or something like that? And, and I, I, the counter that I would say, and this is, this is me engaging of a moment of real time. How many, how many sociologists are here? Um, so there's a few of us. So this is, this is uh, sociologists, maybe political scientists. Um, I, I think that, that, um, that, that sociology and political science has given way, way too much of a free pass to the sort of one weird trick psychology sort of ideas. In other words, the idea that, that because I, I think if, if there is a central message of, of sociology, I think, um, it is that it is that big things are caused by other big things, right? Big differences in life are caused by other big differences. Uh, pervasive, a lot of social life is pervasive, and it's very hard to change uh, because of that pervasiveness, right? And and you look at a lot of the applications of 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 psychology, especially things, some of these things that have replication problems, and it's about the idea of well. Did you know if we just have people think about this thing differently and with a 10 second or 10 minute intervention we can get to think that differently will cause this dramatic difference in how they perform on standardized tests or how they'll do on this or how they'll do on that. Um, which is a very different idea, right? This idea of small things, uh, internal psychological things causing big things that I think is not uh, received enough credit. So whether or not that, how exactly, but you, these things start to add up and if you read if you're familiar with the, the framing things, the, the idea that if you prime people with, with sandpaper, they'll be meaner, or if you prime them with, with disgusting things, they'll want to go wash their... Anyway, all of that kind of stuff. That, 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 that things I do, that, I do think there's reason to think that that has a, has a toll in terms of how people imagine right, the world might be changed. Um, um, and certainly, I don't think it's something where you should get a free ride just because it might seem trivial uh, to us. Right? The second thing that adds up, so unlikely hypotheses, right? We might even think, and you can make an argument, and people do, right? It's like people need to have these novel ideas, right? But what we would think is they, 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 people can have all kinds of unlikely ideas, but it's a problem when people can, can get publishable evidence for those unlikely ideas, especially if they can get publishable evidence for unlikely ideas that are not true. Now, a lot of, I think, people looking at the timing of different events in, in uh, psychology from afar might think that the, the Diedrich Stoppel fraud thing touched off a lot of the things that came thereafter. Um, I think if you talk to people in the field, and certainly if you look at discourse from people in the field, a much bigger uh, incident for this was uh, the study by Daryl Bem um, showing evidence of uh, precognition. Um, finding eight of nine experiments uh, published in uh, the paper, finding uh, evidence uh, uh, in effect, you could think of it as evidence that people engaged in behavior as if they could tell whether they were going to be assigned to the treatment or control group of something they were assigned to after they behaved, right? Um, uh, and, and, um, and so, um, obviously, if you believe in precognition, that's interesting. But if you don't believe in precognition, it's even more interesting, right? Because it's like, well, how, how can a study that looks evidentiary, just the same as all of these other studies, but, but clearly is finding something that, that would cause me to reevaluate all of my metaphysics if it were true, right? How does that manage to produce the evidence that it produces, right? And that being 
uh, a wake-up call. And, and uh, uh, sort of along the same uh, time as that, right, you have uh, a study by um, uh, some others that, that uh, facetious study where um, they, they essentially provided, they showed that the, the experiment would be the idea that um, playing the Beatles song, When I'm 64, uh, changed people's age, made them actually chronologically older, right? Um, and uh, the way that they did was, was, of course, that's, we know that that's not the truth. That's what makes it interesting, right, is that they show, well, actually, if we, if we have raw data, which doesn't show evidence of this, but if we're allowed things that people normally do in the course of data analysis, we can get to some spaces of finding in which, in fact, we could publish that. We could put a little star by it in, in uh, uh, sociology and political science table parlance, and we could publish that, right? So this idea of there being... Uh, weaker safeguards. So you can see how this starts then to add up. Because if you have unlikely hypotheses and you have weak safeguards, now you have the case where weak findings are making their way into uh, the literature. Right? But still, we have as a matter of faith right, um, uh, with science that science is self-correcting. So, of course, um, uh, erroneous ideas uh, might get into the literature in a time, but the hope then is that science will self-correct. With the precognition study that I mentioned, uh, uh, another key part of this moment, so that um, paper on precognition was published in uh, a leading uh, social psychology journal on the grounds that, I mean, I, I, don't, I think it's a defensible position to publish it, which is that, you know, we can't just not publish something because it's testing a weird idea if it shows the evidence all uh, in the same way. But then, uh, shortly thereafter, people tried to replicate the study, did not find evidence for it, right? sent it to this same uh, outlet, and uh, got it desk rejected on the grounds that the journal doesn't, as a matter of policy, doesn't publish replications. Now you can see then, this idea of science is self-correcting starts to get, you can see where that's a little tough because it's like, well, how is science self-correcting? If you can publish papers about precognition and publish them here, but, and eventually it had to fish its way and it was published in, in uh, uh, I think, PLOS One, um, not published, in other words, in, in a straightforward psychology. If those findings, then if, if the self-correcting findings cannot find their way uh, into a literature, right? Um, in uh, sociology, it, it, it's, it's kind of amazing because in, in our sociological theory classes now, um, you really do not see, um, in, in a lot of ways, the most important American sociologist of the 20th century was uh, Robert Merton. Um, but Merton is not actually taught very much in sociological, at least in the United States, I don't know about y'all, um, anymore. Um, and yet, he's had this great renaissance when talking about science because he has these things on norms of science. Uh, you may have heard of from the textbook with the economists that I mentioned at the beginning. We've got a whole chapter talking about Mer Merton's norms. You might have think that I was responsible for that, but no, they, they really love uh, Merton's work on the norms of science, right? But, but, but Merton has this great discussion in his work in the 40s uh, talking about um, why there is uh, uh, fraud is almost never heard of in uh, in science, and, and, and his claim is that, that, in fact, scientists are subject to rigorous uh, policing, right, to a degree that's perhaps unparalleled in any other field of activity, right, that scientists are watching other scientists and making sure that they're not cheating. Now, this, again, if you look to uh, the Stoppel uh, case, and the Stoppel, Stoppel has this great uh, discussion um, he uses this metaphor. Stoppel's actually pretty good, assuming he wrote it himself, a pretty good writer um, in his memoir, right, where, um, yeah, I know there was something about it, right, but, um, but of a cookie jar, where he describes the process of making up data as like, it's like, nobody ever checked what I was doing. Uh, people trusted me, and so it was like working with this giant cookie jar at my desk, and I would just have to take a, take a cookie, and I could eat it, and there was nobody who was ever, I was never going to be called into account for this, right? And you, so you can see then, right, if you, have, uh, if you have a system where you have, you have a lot of unlikely hypotheses, right, and in fact, you have something where the fact that a number of unlikely ideas have already been printed makes even more unlikely ideas, if you think that those are true, also plausibly true, you have a, an apparatus where it's, it's not as hard to generate evidence in favor of an unlikely idea as one might hope, certainly than what a literal interpretation of a p-value might lead one to mean, right, or to think, 
Um, and you have something where uh, journals uh, 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 gatekeep against the publication of self uh, correction. And for that matter, people don't seem that interested in doing replication studies to begin with. That's what I'm saying is you can think of a perfect storm where you can have a literature that is replete with false positives without a lot of hope or potential for uh, self-correction, or at least something that is then ripe for the possibility of being disrupted by someone uh, suggesting later that that emperor might be wearing no clothes. Right? I also want to point out because um, one of the things that people will mention with replications is how little incentive there is uh, to do uh, replication because they might be difficult to be published or whatever, that those low incentives to do replications have their own implications for the quality of the work that is subsequently done. Right? And what I mean by this is both, right? so, so firstly, replication is often, I don't, really? Okay, okay, sure. Yeah. What was it supposed to be? I've talked for 40 minutes. No way. No way. I teach a 50 minute class and I have not talked for four. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'll finish whenever you all want me to finish. So I can finish whatever. Okay, but yeah, but I won't take that much more because I'm the last speaker. I'm aware of that, right? <laughs> Which is, but. So you, you both have a situation where, uh, where you might expect, so, so, so replication, because they have low incentives, it's like, oh, let's have students do it, right? Um, isn't it great for that? But then you have a situation where, where you, you have cases where, where then maybe somebody will counter possibly reasonably, like, like this person saying that all of my findings have been undermined by this replication study that they had undergraduates uh, conduct on their behalf. Right? There's actual examples of this. The other part of it is, is of course, then it, it definitely increases the, uh, the idea that the people who will uh, be most likely to try to replicate the work are people who have a particular stake in getting a particular finding. Right? So, so, and it is, it is the case right, that, that one can imagine that if somebody uh, um, it's clearly the case, and there's scientific examples, or examples of this in natural sciences as well. When people don't believe a finding is true, then, then for something like an experiment, then even if they're trying to conduct it in good faith, they still, they still, if they don't think the treatment really makes a difference, then all of the stuff they're doing to do it exactly right is just to, to please. They're not, they don't really think that it's important because they don't really think that it matters. Right? Um, and so it can distort it that way. Uh, I'm just going to skip this. Um, because I want to talk about the, the epistemic virtue, because I think that there are two. Um, one is uh, what we might talk about as being uh, disclosure, right? This idea of, of transparency, um, but really kind of a radical disclosure, right? In sociology, we talk, a famous sociological theorist is Irving Goffman, and he has this idea of the front stage that we see in the backstage. And we've always been aware that there's a backstage of science that gets cleaned up before the journal article. But really, we see a movement. I've got an open kitchen here. It's the same idea, right, um, as an open kitchen to a restaurant. The idea that, in fact, we do want to see what is going on in that and wanting to see, have more information that is made uh, available, right? And so we have examples of checklists and badges. Um, and then the other part that I think is being an epistemic virtue is this idea of what we call, we don't mean this in its religious connotation, um, but a meta-analytic uh, fundamentalism. That is to say, you'll see diagrams of a hierarchy of evidence that will have meta-analysis at the top, right? That is to say, the idea that ultimately, right, and this is where we see a change perhaps in objectivity, right, the place that objectivity might come from is uh, in bringing multiple studies together. Right? It's almost like it's a soap, but it's not really a soap. It's, it's more about the idea of there being a collection of studies and locating, locating objectivity in the consistent conclusion that can be drawn, consistent but not too consistent, conclusion that can be drawn from a collection uh, of studies. And we talk about different aspects of that. I'll leave the snowflake out of it because I do want to talk about this last uh, coda here. Um, of it being repeated because a point that, that science studies has made about replication, Harry Collins' book from the, from the uh, uh, 80s and then second edition in the 90s is great on this, on replication, which is that if you just read philosophies of science and think about it, you might think that there's a lot of talk about the decisive experiment, but even that replication, you might think that replications 
uh, resolve scientific controversies. Um, but that, that, as much as we might take that as a matter of faith, the extent to which that actually happens is, uh, is, is easily exaggerated. And in fact, replications can often be very polarizing, where people who didn't, already didn't believe the study have more grounds to not believe the study, um, but people who did believe the study have a lot of reasons to dismiss the replication. Because there's an intrinsic, whenever a replication fails, right, there's always an ambiguity. Uh, that ambiguity is, is the problem, does it say something about the original study, right? Or is it something incorrect or different about the way that the replication was done so it doesn't speak to the integrity of the original study at all? There's no way around that um, uh, except by people coming together and drawing a conclusion. And the example we use to talk about how this shows up in the ways people talk about meta-analysis is we use this example from candidate genes and depression where there was a study that, that really set um, uh, psychiatric genetics on uh, several years of, of work, and then you had meta-analyses uh, come out. Um, and, but the thing about it is, is that the first meta-analyses that came out and even got some attention said, okay, well, this original finding, it hasn't been uh, shown in meta-analysis to have an effect. But that was just the first of multiple meta-analyses, and you have this phenomenon then of the dueling meta-analyses, where different authors are saying, well, we need to make different, if you make different decisions about what studies get included or what studies get excluded, you get different findings to the meta-analysis, right? Um, over to, so you have multiple dueling meta-analyses, and you even then had, well, let's get a group of people together and let's agree on how to do a meta-analysis, pre-register a meta-analysis, because that will solve the problem, but as soon as you had that, then immediately you have the idea of, well, we're going to object to the way that you are pre-registering this because we think that you're already biased from the get-go. So when it finally comes out, then it's still something where it's not itself conclusive. And so what it ends up with to us is sort of like the, the snake that swallows its tail. This is a great, great quote from a book by James Tabory, but people thought the meta-analysis in this Canada gene literature was going to solve uh, the problem, but instead it merely created a new problem on a different plane. The same sort of tension about, about uh, is this judgment expertise or is this judgment bias comes to the fore once again. All right? And there I am done. Thank you. <laughs>
fully available. And so the idea is then that your interlocutor is going to point to a location and say, well, right? I mean, because it could be right, like, okay, so say you've got, say you've got something where, I mean, and this happens, right? It's something where you've got, you've got a politically laden issue, right? Is that somebody will know what choice it is that a different finding, right? And so then they will say, well, this is the choice that you different, right? Um, because it will lead to something that supports my point of view and not your point of view, right? And so then, like, where, where does that ultimately get resolved, right? Or does it ever get resolved? Like, is it the idea of, like, well, then I'm going to argue for, at some point you have to argue, right, for why your decision is more credible than their decision, right? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the Socratic nature of that. <laughs> I was inviting, I, was inv I, should not have, I should not have asked you, answered your question with questions. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, see, now uh, the hands go up. <laughs> can I just briefly, can I just briefly but, finish? But we could talk, but I, I'm, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm familiar with well, that. I have an yeah. answer to it. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, sure, at the end, maybe there are just different values, yeah. and then you're in an impasse. But like that, I think that's um, a more realistic and more productive state than um, trying to say that there is something that, like objectivity that we can all see and all agree on. Right. Um, because I think if, I, I think if we um, operate on the assumption that um, at the end there might be situations where we just differ in, like, in a value system, um, we can... Well, that that's just going to be more, more realistic, and we're going to be able to um, create the tools that um, make it possible for us to be m the most transparent and the most objective, in quotation right. marks, um, as we can. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I myself, I mean, a lot of the... Um, it's, it's, not like we're, it's not like we intend to pay on to, to objectivity. It's, it's, it's instead, um, I, I think that the reason that people keep talking about objectivity, that the reason that people have found it very useful, right, is because they see a threat from the idea of the subjective. And they see a threat from the idea of this isn't just me talking. Um, but instead, there's a reason for this, why you should believe it, even though it contradicts your priors, perhaps. And, and they need a play, and that, and that, and so then it's like, what's the, what's the basis for that, right? And, and so, is it something where we're going to say, well, this is, this is a way that the study was done? Is it going to be in the methods? You, the example from earlier, Skip was talking about with climate change. Is it going to be because we see, like, there's a bunch of experts and they all agree? Uh, on the issue, where is it that we're going to locate the idea for um, uh, this isn't just me, this isn't just my values talking, I have a reason to think this and it's because there's, it accords with reality, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, just very brief one. Could you tell us more about the terminology that uh, was rejected? Oh, well, we <laughs> wanted, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we wanted to call it, um, and I think, I think uh, it would have been we wanted to call it forensic objectivity um, because forensic has two meanings, right? It means uh, uh, connected to a, a, a untangling of malfeasance, right? Um, and to be public, right, about something, which we thought of as being both the character of this. But every reviewer said, if you, you're implying that this is all about fraud and it's not about fraud, and even, yeah, so uh, we knew we were going to lose and we lost. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the very engaging talk. Um, so we spoke about uh, light and darkness today a little bit. So this is a dark ending, more or less, as I read it. Um, so where's, is there some light there when it comes to meta-analysis? I mean, Felix said something about a meta-analysis of uh, pre-registered reports. But that's addressing the publication bias problem, as, mm -hmm. as I understand it, and not so much, I mean, what to include. Right? You said even if you pre-register your meta-analysis, there still are some you know, tweaks that you can make and people might still yeah. come to different findings. So, but is there I, I some don't light? See it as, I don't see it as, as darkness necessarily. I just see it as, um, is that whenever people imagine that something mechanical might get them out of subjectivity, it turns out that they needed subjectivity after all, right? In other words, they need ju judgment and expertise. And when you have judgment and expertise, 
you have these dilemmas about what to, what to believe, right? I mean, it, the, the literature in question, I mean, one can, can see hope in that I think that there, there is uh, more or less a consensus that has emerged on these things. Scientific controversies often will get re resolved. Um, people don't believe that that original finding is, is true anymore. They don't do research like that anymore. Um, but it's often the case that the original investigators will be uh, very close to the last people to assent to that. And it's often the case, not so much in this particular study, but there's other poignant examples where people essentially will get left behind, but the field itself figured out um, uh, how it was going to stand on, on which side of a controversy. Are there any questions from the live stream? <laughs> any questions from the live stream? We should have had this on, <laughs> on Twitch. If we would have had this on Twitch, we could have questions coming in. <laughs> people used to not think that people would watch video games online, and then it turned out that they did. Maybe it's the same for social science methods talks. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we're good.